Hello and welcome to another episode of For Zion's Sake, the Kufi UK podcast. My name is Alex and I'm joined here by Alistair. Hello. And this week we're going to be looking at Israel's just war against Hezbollah. Uh, you may have heard about it already on the news, but we're going to be looking at things that the media isn't covering and also explaining why Hezbollah is a terrorist organisation. That's right. And Hamas is a terrorist organisation, which is why a conservative politician this week wore a hoodie saying Hamas are terrorists, but it has caused quite a storm. That's right. We're also going to be looking at something else which has caused a stir, which is Keir Starmer's sausage faux pas. We're also going to be reading your comments, so do let us know your thoughts down below, and we're also answering some questions. So Alex, the eyes of the world are on Israel right now yep. and the conflict which is um, materialising between Israel and Hezbollah. Of course, we sat here a week ago in the previous podcast. We were talking about the detonating of the pages and of the other electronic devices and we were speculating in terms of uh, the message that Israel was sending mm. to Hezbollah, the, the wider message. We also wondered whether or not this was preemptive of, of maybe a, uh, a a wider picture of Israel targeting Hezbollah following the deconstruction of their communication devices. Yeah. And yes, over the past week, we have seen Israel absolutely pummel Hezbollah yeah. with top commanders being killed, uh, significant members of Hezbollah. Um, and right now, um, the continual targeting of Hezbollah um, uh, positions, Hezbollah leaders, mm. uh, infrastructure, and Hezbollah in return, of course, is uh, continuing to fire at Israel, rockets targeting Tel Aviv. And we must recognize that actually, as we do this podcast, things are developing so yeah. perhaps when by the time you listen to this podcast things have materialized further um a lot of concern throughout the world that we are on the brink of war mm. i would say there is war war is yeah. happening <laughs> yeah. right now and it didn't just start this week yeah and i think that's a really important thing to emphasize exactly and it wasn't israel who started it as well yes. i think it needs to be emphasized massively because i think the media always focuses on Israel when Israel responds rather than on the terrorists when they start the war. Yes. Um, and I think in this case, obviously, Hezbollah, we mentioned it last week, they started this war on October the 8th when Israel was dealing with the issue of, uh, you know, the October 7th invasion by Hamas. Hezbollah didn't give any sympathy to Israel. It joined in the fight to try and help Hamas kill as many Jews as possible. Yes. And so they launched rockets into Israel on uh, October the 8th. From then onwards, they've launched over, I think it's 9,000, is it? it it's 9,000 yeah. from the 8th of October to the 22nd of September. Yeah. And that's important to remember because that number um, expectedly will increase mm. now that there is more intense conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. Yeah. So, but it's important that we do marker the fact that before the start of this recent ex escalation since the 8th of october there have been 9000 rockets yeah almost on a daily basis fired by hezbollah yeah there have been between 80 to 100000 israeli civilians displaced um and you're quite right hezbollah has been doing hamas's bidding at the north that is quite clear and this isn't just something which has happened overnight israel did not start yeah. this war so let us not um be otherwise persuaded by the narrative that is in the media yeah because yes yeah no no well i was yeah. going to say yeah because that is the narrative they're basically yes. saying this is a huge provocation israel's doing a massive provocation well let me tell you nine thousand rockets is a provocation you absolutely know, that is. is what led to this yes and of course israel has been concerned that hezbollah would do something um, very significant in terms of escalation. We know that Hezbollah is a proxy of Iran. Uh, we know that Hezbollah is virtually Iran yep. on the border of Israel. And Israel has made it very clear that this is not an attack on Lebanon. Yep. 
this is not an attack on the Lebanese people. This is an attack on Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization. Yeah. An organization that has uh, stated that it wants to wipe out Israel, uh, wants to reclaim uh, Jerusalem in the name of Islam. Yeah. This is an Islamist jihadist terrorist organization. The Hezbollah is also responsible for terrorism throughout the world, yep. including um, in Europe. It is also part of a massive network of international crime, not related to terrorism, but which actually funds terrorism all the yep. way from South America to Europe and throughout the world. Yeah, Hezbollah exactly. is a large organization. It's different to Hamas, um, and it has around 800,000 rockets aimed at Israel, ready to launch at any moment. But Israel has taken, well, has said enough is enough. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, even though they've got that capability, I think what Israel has done over the last week, week and a half, mm. is, is, is almost, not nullify that threat, but has, has set them back. Apparently, uh, US officials think that they've, Hezbollah has been set back about 20 years in the last week and a half, with how much damage has been done. Um, Israel have come out saying that they think that they have taken out half of all of Hezbollah's short-range missile capacity. Obviously, if you look at the number of commanders who have been killed, from obviously Hassan Nasrallah is the leader of Hezbollah. Mm. Below him, his two senior officials are dead. The the, the four or five below those have, have been killed. Like. There is a massive gulf now in the leadership of Hezbollah. Obviously, the communication devices, we spoke about this last week, they were not just innocent civilians. These were not low-down Hezbollah mm -hmm. operatives. These were senior um, officers of Hezbollah. It was a very organized, militant Islamist group. Yes. And it had, you know, it basically had its communications devices taken away from it in one fell swoop. Yes, you know, and also they had to Hezbollah leaders then had to uh, find other ways of communication, yeah. and Israel took advantage of that depletion of Hezbollah's uh, communication to really, yeah, as I say, pummel the um, yeah the the, the, the uh, terrorist organization. Yeah, and yeah, there there was uh, one. Uh, leader who was who had a seven million pound bounty on his head from the U.S. because he was responsible for the uh, 1983 bombing of the U.S. Army barracks, which killed over 250 mm. uh, U.S. soldiers, um, and he was taken out when they had to meet physically rather than using these devices. And he came to the surface for the first time and was and was killed. So that's yes. one example there. But I think what's important to point out is what israel is doing right now is still i you know it's still message sending in a way because yes. hezbollah has not got the message iran has not yet got the message iran controls hezbollah funds hezbollah yeah. is responsible for this terror group um hezbollah's only existence is to take out uh or to to put in a muslim caliphate or something along those lines but the main objective is to rid the world of israel i just want to say a quote here from the hezbollah leader um, because I think this also shows what you're saying about the the war that Israel is on is not against the people of Lebanon. Mm. It is against the Hezbollah terrorist organization. And so he said, quote from Hassan Nasrallah, Lebanon was a Christian country, but we took it and now it's ours. After we kill all the Jews in Palestine, we will just have begun. We won't stop until every country on earth is ruled by the law of Allah and the people of Islam, like our prophet promised. So he is clearly anti-Christian, anti-Jews, anti-anyone who is not an Islamist like him. Mm. And actually, he would probably also be against many Muslims who do not believe the same form of Islam that he believes. Mm. And actually, like we've said before, when the um, the fo uh, you know the detonations took place of the walkie-talkies and mm. the pages. There was actually a lot of celebrations around the Middle East because ha Hassan Nasrallah is seen as an evil mm. in the region that needs to be mm. dealt with. And, you know, certain countries and definitely many individuals within countries are happy with what Israel's doing because Hezbollah doesn't represent the Lebanese people. Mm. I actually saw a 
interesting quote which was like shame it said this shame on anyone who calls hezbollah resistance and shame on anyone who calls hezbollah lebanese because we often say hezbollah is a lebanese all their terror friends group. So. all their friends yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. carry on yeah well, that's a totally other yeah. issue yeah yeah but with the that's the thing we always say like it's a lebanese terror group well it's not hezbollah yeah. actually took over lebanon yeah. and oppressed the lebanese people killed you yeah. know the christian leaders of the time like in the 70s it was a christian nation yeah and and that's what they're about they are a terrorist yeah. organization yes and, and yeah. with a well a deep christian heritage going Lebanon, back yeah. se- for centuries i yeah. mean um and many christians have had to flee lebanon mm. and you're quite right i mean it's important that we as we pray regarding this situation we pray for the lebanese people who are against hezbollah who want yeah. to live in peace that is they share that if those who want peace share it with israel and israel is you know the last line of defense against islamist terror in the middle east and throughout the world yeah exactly. and those who have their eyes open can see that yeah and that is why we need a strong israel that has the support of the United Kingdom and all freedom-loving nations yeah, around the world. Just remember that Israel, in square miles, is around the size of Wales. Yeah. Okay. I think there's just a few miles, square miles difference between the two. Yeah. The size of Wales, a country that is blessed, a country that is hugely significant, both to Jews. To Christians and throughout the world, yep. a country that God Himself has called out as being His inheritance, a land given to the Jewish people. Yep. But this land geographically is so small yeah. on the globe, yet is the target um, of and the the center of so much hatred of god's enemies around the world yeah sorry in the region well and around the world, uh, and sorry. around the world <laughs> yeah. but you understand what yeah. i mean like hamas hezbollah the houthis the iranian regime other palestinian islamist groups yeah. like the pij isis and anyone else that is subscribed to their ideology yeah just this i don't want to say just strip of land because as you know as uh, as believers in the bible Right, we understand it's not just a strip of land, yeah. but in the world's terms, a strip of land, yep. and yet so hugely significant in to the Islamists as being wanting to be taken. I know. I mean, this is not just a physical battle. Alex. Nope. This has to be a spiritual one. Well, it definitely well. is a spiritual battle, and I think it proves it. Like you're saying, like in the world's eyes, they often characterize it as one of land, one of uh, you know it's sort of it's all about land actually is what they say they they try to strip it of its religious sort of narrative or in our our case the spiritual element Mm. to it and the thing is the reason why they want to get rid of um the jewish people is not actually because of the jewish people it's because of who's behind the jewish people god almighty Mm. he is the one who gave them that land he's the one that blessed them and ultimately satan's plan is to destroy the things of god he he wants to be God. He wants to destroy God. If he mm. can destroy Israel, you know, the place which God repeatedly said in his word, these are my people, this is my land, you will never be wiped out. Mm. You know, I will protect you forever. Well, Satan is convincing the world to go against Israel because Satan believes if he can wipe out Israel and the Jewish people, then he can prove God to be a liar and he can mm. defeat God, right? Absolutely. And, and the thing is as well, we we say this often, like, uh, well, in my church, I'd actually say, my pastor says this way, he says, uh, demons believe in God, they just don't worship God. And this is the thing where I think when you try and divorce it from its spiritual nature, it it makes it, there's no relevance to it. It's just a piece of land, why doesn't someone give mm-hmm. it up, that kind of thing. But actually, Satan, he believes the Bible when God said it's for the Jewish people. He wants to destroy it because of this spiritual war he's got where he wants to destroy the things of God, destroy Mm. God himself. And actually, as Christians, if we're blinded to this, you know, I do think it is a very big 
problem for Christians yes. to not see that because Satan is trying to manipulate and convince us that it's not a spiritual battle, it's just a piece of land. Well, actually, you know, I think we're spiritually dead if we don't see that. Yes. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it is a spiritual battle we are in. Christians need to open their eyes and wake up. Yes. You know, these you know, Hezbollah, the leader there, he's not just saying we want to destroy Israel. He's saying we want to destroy Christians as well. We want to, you know, yeah. take over the entire world, you know? Yeah. And that's Satan's plans as well. Yeah, abs- absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Which is why, you know, we need to know who the enemy is and mm. not to give um, any sort of concession mm. to any of these groups. Um, those who you might hear on the news commentating on social media accusing Israel of starting this, um, just, I just want to go back to that yeah. that point because throughout the history of the modern state of Israel, Israel has been at war numerous times, of course. Yeah. And 1948, the Arab-Israel War. 48 to 67, the Fedayeen. 67, the Six-Day War, a well-known conflict, mm. of course. 67 to 70 the War of Attrition, 1973, the Yom Kippur War, 71 to 82, the Palestinian uprising in Lebanon, 85 to 2000, the Lebanon conflict, 87 to 93 was the first intifada, 2000 to 2005 was the second intifada, 2006 was the Lebanon War, 2008 was the first Gaza War, 2012 was the Israel-Gaza operation, 2014 was the second Gaza war. 2021 was the Israel-Gaza crisis. Do you remember those 13 days or something mm. uh, in 2021? Um, and then in 2023, starting, of course, the Israel-Hamas war, the latest conflict yeah. um, since the 7th of October. All of those conflicts in the modern state of Israel were not started by Israel. Yeah, Every single one without exception yeah and yet do you know also each and every one of those conflicts were won victoriously by the state of israel yeah every single one every single conflict since 1948 was not started by israel but was won by israel yeah is this time going to be any exception no, yep. I don't believe so. I believe that this war, this conflict that Israel did not start will be won by Israel. Yep. And Hezbollah, the Iranian regime, and every enemy that sets itself against the state of Israel needs to get the message. Yep. And if they want peace, which we know they don't, they need to get that message quick. Yeah. We don't want to see war. We are praying for peace. We want to see peace, right? Yeah. We don't want war. But this is the message history testifies that if you pick a fight with Israel, then Israel is going to win. Yeah. Why? Because it has to. Yeah. It has to. Yeah. Hezbollah doesn't fight for its survival. It doesn't. Mm. It fights for the destruction of Israel. Yeah. But Israel has to fight for its survival. Exactly. It doesn't fight for the destruction of any other country. Don't believe the lies. Yeah. They fight for their survival. That's right. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I think that narrative is, again, one that's being put out in the media. Or not just the media, anti-Israel protesters on the streets of London are basically accusing Israel of genocide, accusing Israel of wanting to wipe out the Palestinian people. Now they'll be accusing people of, uh, you know, Israel of wanting to wipe out Lebanon, etc. It's not true. Israel is simply not wanting to die. And it's that kind of saying where, um, you know, the Jews refuse to die and that's why the world hates them because mm. that's what they're doing. Mm. They are refusing to be lay over and be killed. They are fighting back and standing up for themselves. That's what they have to do. Another thing as well, I mean, it's not just 1948 when it started. Mm. You know, people try and say that if Israel hadn't come around, then 
none of these problems would have happened. Do you mean, let me put it another way, not in your words, okay. of course, <laughs> if Israel didn't exist. If Israel didn't exist, yeah. Well, that's what they say. If Israel didn't exist, these wouldn't happen. Well, before 1948, Jews were living in the land of Israel. Jews were in Jerusalem. Jews were the majority within Jerusalem mm. uh, by, I think, was it 1980? Uh, sorry, 1890 in, or something like that. Wasn't yeah, it? Well, it was, actually earlier, in the mid-1800s. Yeah, exactly. And Jerusalem so, particularly was, yeah, yeah, Jews were the majority. Exactly. And they were only the minority before that time because they had been exiled, like, yeah. like so they've been scattered Gattered. among yeah. the nations um, because of the multiple attempts, you know, of evil people who have tried to wipe them out over history. Mm. The most recent attempt, well, apart from October 7th and all these other wars that have happened, the most recent attempt that went global was uh, during the Holocaust, where mm. six million Jews were killed, and I, I do think that Satan's plan, by the way, right now, is the same tactic that he used during the Holocaust. It was, you know, started with words. It went to um, oppressing the Jewish people and then trying to exterminate them through the mm. Nazi regime. I think what we're actually seeing now is a global attempt to do that against Israel. Yes, and we're seeing the whole world now who are. First of all, saying bad words against Israel. They're yeah. then, um, what's the word, Ap- apathetic when yes. Israel is attacked. They yes. condemn Israel whenever Israel does anything. The difference now is the Jewish people are not unprotected. Like The problem with anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism takes many different forms and it can take over anyone, yes. basically. I think it was the late Lord Rabbi Sachs yeah. who said that anti-Semitism is a virus exactly. that takes many different forms. Yeah, and it, it morphs. It mutates. mutates. It mutates. That's the yeah, word. Is what yeah. Is, yeah, and that, basically I think that's what happens. And I think but the difference now is Israel exists. Yes. And as the Bible says, when God brings the Jewish people back to the land, which he did in 1948, when he gives them that land, he will never again allow them to be defeated. Yeah. And so ultimately, yes, Israel has its fight for survival at the, you know, the the physical reason it's fighting for its family, fighting for the Jewish people. But ultimately, they're going to win and be victorious because yes. God is on their side and yes. he's protecting them. And on that note, actually, Alex, there are some scriptures that I'd like to share on that th- to support that, uh, because we had a question in our comments um last week in last week's podcast on okay. about uh, god being on israel's side and so when we come to the comments because we are going to be reading comments from the last podcast yep and of course we invite you to please uh share your comment leave your comments on this podcast we're actually going to be looking at that from what the bible says and scripture says mm. about israel being victorious in the end yeah and by actually god being uh the one whom undertakes yep uh on israel's behalf um you raised a very good point about the Holocaust um, being, you know, the example in history of the need to be able to speak out against anti-Semitism. And the, and the worrying trend of passivity in the world right now in terms of what is happening. But I wouldn't say they're passive, actually, because there's a lot of people who have very strong opinions in our media about the conflict. Mm. But just having a lack of moral clarity and right now, um, as we do this podcast, world leaders are going to the United Nations, um, including Prime Minister Netanyahu, whose journey, whose visit, I think, is in the balance right now as we do this podcast, but is planning to go and speak and address um, the UN General Assembly. Mm. The United Kingdom, of course, is represented there and all other nations as well. And that is going to be very interesting. We need to pray for uh, what takes place because yeah. the world lead, you know, leaders around the world are against Israel when they should be standing with Israel. Yeah. And it's the lessons from like when anti, the worst case of anti-Semitism um, in history, which culminated in the Holocaust, mm. we must learn. We must not give yeah, in yeah. to when we see anti-Semitism. And in our lifetime, we have had a wake-up call uh, by what we witnessed on the 7th of October. Yeah. And we are going to be remembering that in the next podcast. We're going to be setting some time aside in the next podcast to to give our remembrance and commemoration to what took place. Mm. And we're inviting 
um, all of our supporters to set some time aside on the 7th of October or um, any date uh, near that, um, inviting our supporters to approach their church um, or any other gathering, a prayer meeting, or even just as a, a family together. We've produ- provided some resources which are available on our website. Um, we've included a prayer um, for, sorry, a reading for prayer and reflection, as well as a number of videos. We have a special candle which is available um, uh, to order in uh, in um, appreciation of a donation towards uh, towards that production and postage. We have a number of these things which are available on our website to equip people to have a remembrance for the 7th of October mm. terrorist attacks. And the website which is on the screen and in the description is www.cufi.org.uk forward slash October 7. Please go on there, visit, um, have a look at the resources and start planning what you can do, uh, even if it is in your own home or maybe at your church on the uh, on Sunday the 6th of October, on the day itself. We're going to be setting some aside in this podcast and we invite you to join us for that special edition next time. Um, but I just wanted to raise that, Alex, because yep. um, we must not forget that all what we are seeing here right now on the news um, goes back actually before the 7th of October, yeah. let's be honest. But we must not forget those atrocities which took place when Hamas invaded Israel, yeah. uh, indiscriminately murdered innocent men, women, and children, yeah. and quite frankly, broke the peace, even though it was a fragile peace. Mm. They broke the ceasefire. They started this, yeah. just as Hezbollah started it in the north. Yeah. And we must remember that at the, the foundation of this is anti-Semitism. Yeah. It is a hatred towards the Jewish people. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and that's why I think the res- result of that attack globally has been quite eye-opening as well. Because ultimately, you know, that was a catalyst catalyst for other events for mm. the war and that sort of thing. But seeing the reaction, the the hatred there is towards the Jewish people, even you know, on the streets of London the day after it happened or mm. the evening it happened, you know, there is such an animosity there. It can only be described, in my opinion, as being a spiritual thing because I don't think mm. any rational person can hate the Jewish people without there being some spirit behind it, spirit of anti-Semitism. Mm. Um, while there is obviously a lot of... um a lot of things to contemplate and things like that at the moment there's obviously some serious topics and, and one of them is the hostages i do want to just point out that there is is some slight good news um that has come out of the hostage situation at the moment and that is that according to benjamin netanyahu the prime minister of israel um half of the hostages are thought to still be alive and i think beforehand uh, there was a lot of speculation how many of them are still alive there was, a, mm. there was speculation about a month or so ago where they thought maybe only around 20 to 30 were alive. But actually, if, if half of them are all alive, and this is, I'll quote him, he said, according to the information we have, half of the hostages in Gaza are alive. Um, and Netanyahu made these comments when he was um, speaking at a closed door session um, of the Knesset's uh, Foreign Affairs and Defence Committee in Jerusalem, and it was reported on Israel's army radio, which is a fairly or very reliable source to, to what Netanyahu mm. said. So just think about that. That could mean 50 or so hostages are alive. And so that, I think, is a bit of hope there. Even though at the moment the uh, hostage negotiations are at a complete roadblock, it seems. Obviously, Israel is fighting a multi-front war with different militaries and is focusing its attention on Hezbollah. We also have to keep the hostages in our memory and also keep hope alive that yes. you know that half of them will come home alive. You yes, know? yes, there is still hope there. So I think we just need to always remember the hostages, continue to pray for them, and have them in our mind because the the entire Absolutely. reason Israel's fighting is for these hostages. Yes, it's fighting for its survival. It's fighting for many different reasons, but 
you know, I think one of the the driving factors, I should say, and maybe not the entire reason, the driving factor for this yes. is to get their hostages home because Israel loves life. Israel does everything it can to defend the people of Israel, to defend the Jewish people. And, you know, while Hamas and Hezbollah hide their rockets in civilian homes, while they hide their rockets underneath children, while they hide their tunnel entrances underneath the cribs of their own children, yes, you know, Israel does everything to defend its people. It it spends all of its resources and money to stop rockets landing on its people. Yes. And it uses its rockets, its weaponry to defend its people while Hamas and Hezbollah use their people to defend their weaponry. I'm really glad you highlighted that. It's important to be reminded of the brutality of Hamas and of Hezbollah. In mm. fact, Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, uh, said this morning that we will destroy every home that has a rocket launcher in it. Yeah. Right? So, you know, that's just a reminder that these yeah. are people's houses that have rocket launchers in. And okay. the warning is that the home. So, um, when we hear on the news that there might be a home that has been hit, think twice. Yeah. Think twice. I'm not denying that there could potentially be mistakes without thinking of anything specific, there is a possibility yeah. mistakes can happen. But when you hear that a house has been hit on the news, think twice. Yeah. Just think, because it's... It, we, we, we must not forget those um, actions by Hamas and Hezbollah that are breaching international law yeah. on two counts. They're breaching international law because they're targeting civilians and they're using civilians as human shields yeah it's really important we have that overarching perspective of what's happening yeah can i say something about that go on yes so, please yeah so one thing that was uh israel was condemned for was the um what are they called the beepers the pages pages that's the one the pages exploding and they were inanimate mm. objects and mm. basically people are saying you shouldn't use inanimate objects well one thing hezbollah is doing right now is using inanimate objects and civilian infrastructure to hold its weaponry and also as launchers so mm. the houses in southern lebanon uh bridget gabriel was talking and she is a lebanese woman who yes. born and raised in lebanon she as escaped a christian war, as a christian yet yeah, she mm. escaped war um and was actually rescued by the idf when mm. she was just a young girl um the hezbollah terrorists came in and literally slaughtered massacred uh and wiped out the Christians in her area, and she had to be rescued. So anyway, she knows a lot about Lebanon. Mm. She was saying just this week that people don't realize this, but because Hezbollah actually is so well embedded within the political situation of Hez mm. uh, of uh, Lebanon, they actually control the you know what happens in terms of building regulations and things like that. And you may not believe this; it sounds quite radical, but. They actually have mandated it that every home being built, every new home, has to have a, a, a an ability to launch rockets from. So either an opening wow. in a roof that can be opened at any point to then launch a rocket from, that wow. kind of thing. So what Hezbollah is doing is exactly what you know the media accused Israel of doing when Israel targeted, in one of the most specific ways ever, mm, the most precise, terrorists, yeah, most yeah, precise yeah, yeah. attacks. But... Hezbollah is doing exactly that. It's using home, civilian homes, inanimate objects, which, like, basically, in the rules of war, you're meant to basically show this is a rocket launcher site. This is a tank. You're not meant to yes. hide them, right? And that's exactly what they're doing. And we've seen videos where Israel has struck a house and then suddenly there's hundreds, if not thousands, of explosions within that because there's ammunition just popping off and mm. exploding. There was one video which I saw uh, just yesterday, and it was a house being hit. And after it got hit by the initial strike, a rocket fired out from the side of it and hit another house wow. that was about 100 meters away from it. And these are big, like they look like nice houses, right? These are not mm. small apartments or anything. And it took out the other house, which was adjacent wow. to it. Obviously, Israel didn't plan for that to happen, but it was because there was a rocket in there. Yes. Israel's released images of these rockets inside ho houses these are not small rockets these are you know quite large things and they are hidden within civilian infrastructure yes but what are we seeing you know hezbollah is releasing or the i should say the lebanese 
Health Ministry, they are releasing information on the deaths. It is far and away adult males. Yeah. Again, you know, mm. I think there are around 500 that have been killed, 600, yeah. something like that. And it's around 100 women and children to 400. I mean, that is a four to one terrorist. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying all the men are terrorists or whatever, but if you're looking at it that yes, way, yes. Yeah. what I'm saying is it's completely different to what you're seeing in other wars where, again, to remind everyone, the UN statistics are seven to one to nine to one in terms of civilian deaths to Militant. combatant deaths. Combatant, yeah. And so, for example, in Yemen, the majority of victims in the Saudi Houthi war were children so if you've only got it where i think it's around 50 children have been killed which is obviously a tragedy it's mm. a big number it's like we we're not negating that every child is precious and we want all of them to live but again it's hezbollah who yeah. are the cause of that yes. but also israel is being as precise as it possibly can be and it is proving well, it statistically absolutely i mean you you raise a very good point there there's a contrast in the tactics which are used yeah and hezbollah which does not value life just as hamas doesn't israel is completely the opposite yeah and there was a story i saw this week that i mean it's unbelievable but this is absolutely true okay israel apparently sent text messages mm. to civilian mobile phones yep. warning them and uh, to to flee, to move out in an area and were specific about where they were going to be targeting mm. and for their own safety were urging civilians to leave the area. Israel managed to do that by sending a text message to everyone's mobile phone. Yep. Guess what story Al Jazeera covered on this? The, the angle that they took, you would not believe it. Um, this is absolute, honest truth. Okay, Al Jazeera ran a headline that were blaming Israel for hacking the mobile phones of the Lebanese civilians. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. Hacking. Yeah. Right? If you want to call it hacking, okay, whatever. They hacked phones to send messages to civilians to protect and save their lives. I know. And yet this, this news agency, which is very anti-Israel, really. it's yeah. a propaganda machine. It shouldn't yeah. even be on our, on our, um, on our TV yeah. listings, in my opinion, even though I believe in the freedom of press. Al Jazeera, in my opinion, is a propaganda machine. Yeah, it's machine. not press. Yeah. It's not press. And so it should be removed from the UK licensing. Yep. I just thought I'd add that. <laughs> but quite frankly, right, how, how yeah, you know, what a twisted mindset yeah. to have that you can look at this at the facts and yet come to the conclusion that Israel was wrong to send messages um, you know, through various means in order to get civilians saved. I know. Al Jazeera would rather civilians be killed I know. at the hands of Israel's attacks than the Lebanese people be saved by yeah. Israel just hacking into the systems. I know. It's crazy. The thing is, it shows like Al Jazeera is, is more unhappy with yeah. Israel saving yes. civilian lives than it yeah. is if they had killed civilians. Right? I know. But think about it like this. I honestly think, you know, Al Jazeera, they are owned and run by Qatar. Qatar is the main funder of mm. Hamas. So Qatar funds Hamas more than mm. Iran funds Hamas, right? If, for example, Hamas is happy to use civilians as human shields, if Hezbollah is happy to use civilians as human mm. shields, why? Because it makes Israel look bad, yeah. right? I honestly think Al Jazeera's on the same boat. I think they are unhappy because they want civilians dead yes. to make Israel look bad yes. rather than Israel saving their lives. Yes. It is it is so revolting. And like you said, it, they should not be allowed yeah. uh access. They, I mean, I'm I'm absolutely shocked that Ofcom hasn't shut them down for the lies they're spreading. I know. And I I'm know. also it's shocked because the BBC keeps um recruiting people from Al Jazeera. I know. And then you wonder why they're so anti Israel. Well that, uh, that's a very, very good point. And you know, just think. Last week, Israel allegedly, uh, you know, hacked somehow into electronic devices and pages to detonate and cause explosions on Hezbollah terrorists. Yeah. This week, uh, hacked 
civilian mobile phones in order to send them messages to save their lives. Yeah. If we want to talk about a moral clarity, I know. Okay, Israel is playing on different, completely different terms yeah. to these terrorist groups. And let's let's not forget. I know we, you know, we might sound a bit parrots here, yeah. repeating the same thing. But these are terrorist organizations. They yeah. play by terrorist rules. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned the hostages. We need to continue to pray for their uh, release, their rescue, and. Um, I, it reminded me, as you were talking, I was actually just pulling up an article, um, and I'm going to go all the way back, because we, right. <laughs> we continue to, uh, to, to discuss on this issue, and I just want to go back to the hostages, but yep. it, it is another reminder of the, the, the different game rules when it comes to the terrorists, and this is a, a great example, um, because do you remember during the negotiations for hostage release, um, it collapsed mm. in November after some successful um, um, release of hostages. And this is what the Times of Israel reported, uh, uh, reported this week. Um, Israeli television on Wednesday reported that November's hostage truce deal collapsed after a week because Hamas, instead of the 10 living hostages it was supposed to release on the eighth day of the deal, offered to return seven bodies and three living captives, who were two men and one woman. Okay, so seven, in, we didn't hear this at no. this time, but the deal was they were going to release seven dead hostages and three living hostages. However, it says, in fact, the report quoted a senior Israeli security source saying Israel knew that the women among the seven purportedly dead hostages were alive. Right, and assessed that Hamas would immediately kill them if Israel accepted the changed terms. Wow, that is that is terrible. I never knew that. I, I mean, just think about that. Uh, I mean, and we know as well. Like, obviously, with the six, was it six hostages that were killed in the tunnel? Yes, yeah. Um, they were killed literally moments yes, before yeah. Israel turned up because Hamas just wants yeah. to kill them. But I think it's really important yeah. that we, you know, we don't fully appreciate um, the whole gravity. I mean, we know Hamas is bad, yeah, but we don't always realize, you know, what that actually means when it comes to negotiating terms. So this this were a, a, a group of ten living hostages. Okay, so, yeah. sorry, uh, they were ten living, but they promised to return seven dead hostages and three living when there's in fact israeli security it's uh, israeli security intelligence knew they were alive had the israeli government agreed to that terms thinking that they were going to get some dead hostages returned hamas were prepared to kill them after the negotiation was made to fulfill that promise whereas actually israel decided no we're not going to agree to this I and made, and as a result, they lived. I know. And we can only trust and hope and pray that they are still alive. But just think, just imagine that, I that know. decision. And so we only hear, you know, sometimes we only hear bits and pieces of these stories. But that shows the great depth of the depravity yeah. of Hamas. This is who we're dealing with. We're not dealing with logical. I mean, they won't be terrorists if we were dealing with logical people, right? Yeah. But this is how grotesque how evil yeah absolutely from the pit of hell yeah and we need to and this leads on i think to our declaration that hamas is a terrorist organization right yeah. alex yep okay you can say it you don't worry about saying it because they are yeah hamas are terrorists they are terrorists sign keeps saying and um they are terrorists according to UK law as well. Yeah. And despite that, Robert Jenrick, a Conservative MP, former cabinet minister who is actually running as a candidate for the Conservative leadership. Well, this week he was actually running in a different capacity. He was actually out jogging in central London, an early morning jog, and he had a selfie taken with a, a passerby, a supporter. 
And he was wearing a... Uh, the, Robert Jenrick, the politician, was wearing a hoodie which said Hamas are terrorists. Yep. This photo has gone viral. Um, it has cooked up a storm because we were delighted to see that a, a politician was wearing a hoodie stating the fact, yep. stating the law, stating the truth and having the boldness to go out of the run in his own time in london of all in places. london yeah um stating that truth um but not everyone is very happy <laughs> yeah and there is a um th- there was a clip on sky news of Kay burley the sky news presenter uh who was interviewing a shabo uh, shabo a shadow cabinet minister um trying to pick holes at um, robert Jenrick's uh, decision to wear this hoodie and she actually said this is incitement yeah this is incitement isn't it she didn't even ask the, just the question she actually stated this is incitement I like know. they are a terrorist organization i know that is the truth yeah and she she also said uh that's not very adult like she yes. said why why is he there smiling with a t-shirt on saying hamas a terrorist that's not very adult no it's not very, it's shall like, we shall we not be very adult well let's not be very Ready? adult okay hamas are terrorists hamas are terrorists there, there you go. go hopefully there we go <laughs> hopefully hamas are terrorists flashed up on the screen while we were smiling <laughs> yeah. not being very adult there are yeah. we alistair no but no, who, we who, who are Sorry. we inciting <laughs> no, but who are we <laughs> inciting there i mean incitement i'll just read the definition the dictionary yes. definition the action of provoking unlawful behavior or urging someone to behave unlawfully. Yes. Well, he wasn't inciting Hamas to be terrorists. No. Unless she's implying that um, his actions now are going to result in Hamas doing terror. Or, I mean, what, what she's saying? Is she saying that Jenrick is inciting Hamas to murder him? Is she saying Jenrick is inciting... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, I what, know. what on earth is she yes, saying? Like, I know. Hamas is a terrorist organization. I think really what she's getting at is this is going to upset. So provoking. Pro- yeah, this is going to provoke. And there act- is a difference between provoking and something being provocative and something yeah. being insightful. Exactly. Okay? I, I wouldn't necessarily um, encourage everyone to go out on a jog with a hoodie saying Hamas are terrorists because it might be unwise. Yeah. It might provoke. But to incite is completely different. Yeah. You should be allowed, anyone should be allowed to go and hold a placard yep. at a protest, wear a t-shirt, stating the truth that Hamas are terrorists. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is the thing that's going on at the moment. We've seen it. There's uh, an Iranian um, who's a dissident, Iranian dissident. He's anti the Iranian regime. And he keeps getting arrested by police because he holds up this sign which says mm. Hamas are terrorists. And he gets arrested because he's provoking uh, the crowd. Is, is This is the excuse from the police. Ultimately, if someone is being provoked by that, it shows they support Hamas as a terrorist organization. Mm-hmm. And this is the thing where, you know, we have to get things right side again. They're back to front at the yes. moment. We're arresting people who are provoking terror. Well, Hamas is an outlawed terror group in the UK. Support for terrorism, support for Hamas, is yes. a criminal offence. Yes, being a member of Hamas is a criminal offence. Showing, you know, showing support for Hamas is criminal. Yeah. So if you hold up a sign and someone is provoked by that and they attack you for it, well, they're probably a supporter of Hamas, therefore a criminal, and they should be arrested. Yeah. Instead, the police are arresting the person who's holding the sign. And I think this is the thing with with Jenrick. I, I do think you have to be wise. I don't think it's the wisest thing in yeah. the world to provoke terrorists because we do know there are Hamas supporters in this yes. country. Yeah. You know, but the police have to wise up. If we look at what's happening in Germany at the moment, Germany is cracking down actually on a lot of this provocation because I think they're seeing the mass problems they've got with the mass importations and and all these different things where they, you know, people who are supporting these sorts of messages are allowed free have been given freedom on the streets and now they're seeing the the negative impact of that in their country. I think in the UK, we're... Sorry, what do you mean they're cracking down on provoca- in what, well, what they, sense? Sorry, yeah, they're cracking down. They are now arresting people who are showing support for Hamas. Right, they're yeah. even arresting people showing who are holding up Palestinian flags and, and provoking that way. So but Good, absolutely yeah, no, going, right. Yeah, they're going the right way in that. 
And so, but I think in the UK, we are absolutely naive to it. Mm. We we don't realize that there are people in this country no. who are Hamas supporters, who yeah. support, not only call for the destruction of Israel, but also call for the destruction of the UK itself. In the West, yeah. You know, that sort of thing. And I think... We just don't like upsetting we don't, terrorists yeah. sim- sympathizers. I know, we? or terrorists themselves. Mm. And, and I think this is where we have to get back on the right page. And thankfully, there is a slightly good news story on this where there was a a protest going on pro-Palestinian and there was a counter-protest of people holding up Israeli flags. And one of the people on the megaphone started to chant things like, I love the October, uh, quote, quote, I love the October 7th attacks and I love an organization that begins with H. Right. Obviously, we know what he was referring to. Thankfully, police arrested. Could him. have been Hamas or Hezbollah. Well, it could have been. It could have been both. I think actually he was implied. <laughs> well, the both. Is. Well, I, I actually think he meant both because he yeah. said he started off by saying, "I like an." I was I jesting. Love, of yeah, course, and yeah, I know. Uh, but he sort of said something like, "I love an organization organization that begins with H." And then he said, "I love H letter. I love H letter." And I think that is Hezbollah. Like you yes, were sort yeah. of saying that. But anyway. Supporting terrorism. I know, ridiculous. Yeah, thankfully, he was arrested. He wasn't arrested at the time when mm. police were in the presence of him and no. they saw him saying it. But afterwards, after there was outrage because it went viral on the internet, then he was arrested. What about the young women who had stickers of paragliders on, on the back of their shirts? I know. And you remember that they were, effectively, they were let off. Yeah. And yes, and I think there is a lot of this talk of two-tier policing, two-tier, two-tier care, things like that. Obviously, we're not going to get into those those sorts of things, although yeah. we will talk about Keir Starmer well, in a minute. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, we are seeing that. We are seeing two-tier policing where people who are against Hamas are being arrested for non-crimes and people who are supporting yeah. Hamas are not being arrested for actual crimes. Yes. Supporting Hamas is a crime in this country and the government has to do something about yes. it. Well, let's talk about two state Starmer, shall two we? State Starmer, yeah. Um, and we probably need to talk about his speech where he uh, had a, a slip of the tongue of, of over a major gaffe, actually, yeah. uh, where he referred to the hostages as sausages. Yeah. Now, on any other subject, that would have been, well, it would have been hilarious, except for the fact that this is a very serious. Um, uh, topic yeah it is a subject that we hold with reverence so we're not going to you know start making uh you know lots of jokes and memes about sausages and things like that because you know we have to remember that this is about the hostages that are held captive in israel and so we're not going to make light of it uh but i mean what a what a gaff yeah. to make and is yeah. there can, uh, what do we read into this because of all the topics to be to um to speak about yeah uh, sorry to make a mistake on in that speech a keynote speech his first ever speech at a party conference as prime minister yeah and of all the serious issues that the country is currently going through in which he addressed he makes that mistake on saying calling for um uh, calling for the release of the sausages yeah. <laughs> the thing is when you say it like that it does it is comedic and it is a, a slip of the tongue yeah, so Honestly, he actually said return of the sausages yeah, re- return of the sausages yeah. the thing is i mean let's just point out here this was this was a faux pas he had just said ceasefire we we call him for an immediate ceasefire and we uh call him for the return of the sausages but he he clearly got ceasefire and hostages mixed yeah, yeah, together yeah. in his mind. He corrected it straight away. He was reading from an auto cue. Me and you, we have filmed many times with auto cues. Well, I'm normally behind the camera. You're in front of it, sort of thing. And we've had the same thing where you've not even realised you've said something slightly what? wrong or whatever. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what if you I don't know what a... you're talking yeah, about. <laughs> exactly. I'm normally fine. It's... Yeah. I think yeah. even earlier in the podcast, you know, uh, you said something. Oh, a few weeks ago. No, no, the, today you said something where you corrected yourself after saying a word wrong, and I've probably done it. But I think every podcast, you or I, messes up a word. You know, it happens to all of us. But I do think this highlights something, because this, like you said, it was his first speech since he's prime minister at the party conference. This was his big push to push his agenda, to get everything out there. And I think another th- angle of it is, since they've been in power, since Labour's been in power with 
Starmer at the helm, the UK-Israel relationship has taken a hit. Mm. He has shown himself, the Labour government has shown themselves, to not be as friendly towards Israel as the UK used to be, to not be as friendly as we want them to be, and in some ways to be anti-Israel. Mm. I mean, it was Starmer and Lamy who decided to start an arms embargo with Israel. Yeah. And then what do we see here? We see him giving his big speech, and just as he mentions hostages, he says sausages. Mm. Suddenly there's memes, people yeah. making jokes of him. The Twitter yesterday was, or X was trending, sausages, right? Mm. I don't even know what his other policies are. All I know is he made that slip up. And, and to those who are anti-Israel, yeah. it, is, it is a welcome slip for the time because it's, they probably think it's, it's mocking. Uh, mocking. Yeah. Exactly. And ultimately, we know most sausages made are pork products. Mm. The anti-Semitic slurs are calling uh, Jews pigs, that kind of thing. Mm. And, and actually, I do think there could be a case now where you might hear some insults where people are mm. calling it that or saying, we don't even care about your sausages or whatever, like mm. just mocking the hostages. But I actually think this was, maybe it was God doing something. Maybe it was his subconscious causing it. I don't know. But the most important topic in God's eyes right now mm. is those hostages, his people who have mm-hmm. been taken. And, and it got brought and down. It got, yeah, and it got brought down. And, and yeah. it was... A man who has enacted an arms embargo against Israel. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. He made that slip up. His whole speech was derailed by that slip up. And we shouldn't look at the word sausages. We should look at the word hostages. You know, the hostages are now, I mean, they have been for a long time. You know, the eyes of the world are on Israel. The eyes of the world, everyone knows about the hostages. It is a massive topic. So they immediately will know what he was talking about, what he was meant to say. Yeah. Maybe it was God drawing the world's attention to this. Maybe it was, you know, him maybe being it was made sim- an example of, you know, a simple... Or maybe it was symbolic of the fact that the current government has made a mockery mm. of its handling with Israel. And that was like a yeah a, a signal, uh, a manifestation of that mockery. Yeah. Um, we can read into it lots of things, perhaps, but... Yes, it yeah. was a bad mistake. And, um, yeah. but, but I think the end result, though, is, you know, someone who has been anti-Israel in certain aspects mm. has been brought down slightly. Yes. And, you know, the whole world, or at least the UK side of things, started talking about the hostages because they were forced to. That's so, you true. Know, you never I know. Mean, people, the, yeah, you never know. Yeah. You never know. We all place that in God's hands. Yep. We are pleased to announce that the 2024 to 2025 calendar from Christians United for Israel UK is now available to purchase. The title for this year's calendar is The Beauty of Zion. Israel is beautiful and the Bible paints vivid images in our minds through the emotive words used to describe this land of promise. We hope you can experience the beauty of Zion as you make use of the calendar throughout the year. The calendar includes 16 stunning images of Israel with selected inspirational scriptures to help focus your prayers for God's chosen people and their land. The calendar also includes UK Christian and Jewish holidays for the 16 months and includes weekly Torah portions. Plus, we also offer a special bundle discount for adding a mug and greeting cards to the calendar. By purchasing a calendar, or one of our gift bundles, you are supporting the work of Kufi in standing for Israel in the UK. Go to store.cufi.org.uk. Okay, then, Alex, shall we read some comments yep. from the previous podcast? Uh, just to remind everyone, we invite you to please leave your comments um, uh, below. Uh, we would like to know what your thoughts are about some of the topics that we've discussed. Uh, in this podcast perhaps you have thoughts about the war between israel and hezbollah uh, any of the other things we've talked about uh, please let us know your views about uh, keir starmer's um, uh, mishap in his speech whatever um, you might like to share with us we're very grateful for your comments yep so last week um we uh, we of course talked about um the detonation of pages and walkie-talkies 
uh, belonging to Hezbollah terrorists, and we talked about a couple of other things as well. Um, starting then, um, the next time, Joanne says, the next time you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, know that you are praying for the wholeness of God's covenant land and her people, Israel forever. Um, amen to that. Amen. Judy says, the UN order to evacuate all Jews from the so-called occupied Palestinian territories is the direct equivalent of the worst of Nazism. I agree completely. Yeah, I mean, that is such a major topic, the whole world, trying to rid yeah. the Jewish people of the land God gave them. It, yeah, it's, yes. it's terrible. And yeah. that relates to uh, what was passed last week at the United Nations yep. when the uh, Palestinian Authority was given a seat and put forward the call for the Jews, uh, for Israel, basically to be pushed out of yep. um, the so-called, quote, uh, occupied Palestinian territories. Joseph has asked us if we could look into direct lin links between the UN and Hamas. Uh, the UN owned or funded all the buildings that Hamas were hiding in in Gaza. They give free money to illegal immigrants around the world, etc., etc. Just on that topic then of direct links between the UN and Hamas, um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I mean... It's one of these things where the UN will often say, you know, we had no idea that this was going on. Mm. You know, there were tunnels underneath the UN buildings because there's tunnels under everywhere in Gaza. That's literally what the UN General Secretary Guterres actually said this week. So, mm. you know, they, they will try and make it that they have no idea. But ultimately, UNRWA itself, I, I wouldn't say Hamas and the UN have links necessarily. Uh, because I think that would be very hard to prove. I think if you're going to go down that route, uh, mm. we, you know, even our government, you know, gives money to UNRWA, gives money to the UN. There's links there, and it's it gets a bit sort of muddied waters, sort of mm. thing. And same thing as well with the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority pays terrorists directly, while we fund the Palestinian Authority. Therefore, we are funding terror as taxpayers. The same thing happens with the UN. So it's unfortunately very hard to prove. But direct links, well. There was one very clear direct link, and that is that whenever um, the United Nations, the UNRWA head, the United Nations Work, Relief and Works Agency, uh, whenever they um, would criticize Hamas, they would be ousted from the organization very quickly. Mm. I think that shows how, uh, you know, this is even before the war for the last sort of 10 years or so, UNRWA leaders in Gaza had to be very careful how they spoke about Hamas, because as mm. soon as, for example, one of them was ousted because he said, the Israeli, we you know, we know civilians are fairly safe because Israel strikes are very accurate. As soon as he said that, he was ousted, kicked out of Gaza by Hamas, and UNRWA replaced him with a more pro-Hamas sympathizer. Mm. Um, but if like the most clear direct link that there is really is the fact that UNRWA's headquarters, directly under it, was a Hamas headquarters, and the electricity was shared between UNRWA and Hamas. So if you want a real direct link. You can't get more direct. Than Look that. at the electricity <laughs> bill. <laughs> Look at the electricity bill. <laughs> so I mean, that just proves yes. it. And I think there are unfortunately, you know, anybody yeah. who was operating within Gaza before October seventh mm. or before you know Israel went in, I think they had to have some involvement with mm. Hamas in some way. And of course, Israel produced a report which um, revealed that there were um, Hamas members that directly carried out attacks in Israel on the 7th of October mm. who were actually staff members of UNRWA. Yeah. And I think the UN, uh, or, or sorry, UNRWA, has, following investigations, it has been proven that I think around half a dozen were UNRWA staff members that were involved in the attacks, but yep. it could have been more. And basically those reports which Israel produced, which were basically the world cast out, the international community cast out on Israel's claims. Well, yeah. actually, they have been proven. Yeah. Um, so in that respect, in direct respect, uh, yes, there are links between individu uh, individuals working for the UN and, having the, uh, and being members yeah. with Hamas. The other thing I just wanted to say is a bit more of a generic um, sort of thought, and that is the separation of Hamas um, as a political entity 
and as a terrorist militant entity has been problematic because the UN has has had dealings with Hamas politically, sorry, quote politically, yeah. with their political wing. And that, um, and I'm trying to recall now, maybe you can jog my memory about uh, even within the past year, there was the UN was being very defensive of some of its track record in dealing with Hamas because it views, you know, it's only dealt with like the political arm. Yeah, yeah. But all of that is a load of nonsense because we know that that is really how they engineer their organization to be able to have dialogue with the West, whereas actually they themselves, they're complete terrorists throughout the organization. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I mean, when um, Ismail Haniye was assassinated by Israel, he was the political bureau chief. Mm. Well, his role now is owned by Yahya Sinwar, who was the military chief. Yes. He now has both roles because they're that well interconnected. Yes, And we know Yahya, uh, sorry, Ismail Haniye was extremely pro-terrorism. Yeah. And it's the same thing as Hezbollah. Hezbollah, for a long time, yeah. they used to say, you know, we've got the political wing and the military wing, and they would mock the West because it was the EU that set that up. Yes. Um, under a British politician, anyway, we won't go into it, that one. But for a long time, the EU saw Hezbollah as having a military wing and a political wing. And the, they would mock and say, oh, today I'm speaking on behalf of the military wing, and to, tomorrow I'm going to speak on behalf yes. of the political wing. Because basically, it, it's the same organization. Yes. And, um, and, and can I just say, um, here at Kufi, we battled this issue yep. because in the UK we followed the uh, the EU's uh, track on that, where we recognised um, uh, Hezbollah's military wing yep. as terrorism, yep. as terrorists, but we didn't ban the political wing for some time, and we campaigned really hard on yeah. that. And thankfully, eventually, a couple of years ago, um, it was. Um, it was passed that Hezbollah was uh, political wing was terrorist as well. Yeah. Now, if that hadn't war. happened right now today, yep. if we had not campaigned, and if that hadn't been achieved, um, we would still have political connections, political dialogue with yeah. Hezbollah's political wing, and we would be having all this discussion that Hezbollah should be banned. Well, yeah. thankfully, you know. Thanks for the Kufi supporters who wrote to MPs at the time. Um, they were banned throughout, but that just shows the problem um, of sort of overlooking the v- reality of the situation. And right now, Hezbollah um, should be condemned fully yep. by the international community. And uh, but just going back to the original question, I do think that historically that has been um a a weakness yeah both at the united nations and in our own government when it comes to links yeah. with these organizations direct or indirect it has been problematic yeah and i think yeah i agree and i yeah just to add to that i mean obviously the question says about us doing a deep dive into it i would say obviously we're not right now doing a deep dive we have in the past done research into it but ultimately there's organizations out there trying to prove these links because they you know it is a massive problem and they're doing much you know more in-depth work on this than we are um but i would say even looking at it from the the problematic side of things even our own government is now giving money again to unra because unra itself is a massive problem and it's been recognized by many countries i mean the the previous government we had here in the uk stopped funding unra because of its links to hamas there are countries right now who are divesting from UNRWA while our own government is investing in UNRWA. Yeah. So in the you know, first few days of yeah. coming to um coming to office in number 10, Keir Starmer actioned the reinstated that funding to yeah, UNRWA. Exactly. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it may may not fully answer the question, but there is definite links mm-hmm. and hopefully in the future we can look into it more. Um another message, um a comment, thank you for the October seventh Remembrance Day document. Um, yes, just to remind everyone that they can find those documents on the website, on our dedicated page on our website uh, for October the 7th, Remembrance. Um, and in a separate message, the same um, um, commenter says, every nation, including the UK, that are against Israel um, uh, might, not might be, but will be cursed by the God of Israel for their actions. Genesis 12, verse 3, they will be sorry for messing with Israel. Yep. You know, we need to take uh, this matter very seriously. 
uh, indeed. Yep. Um, and finally, if um, we just close on this comment, um, hello both. Just to be clear, I'm 100% with Israel, but something you said in the podcast, quote, let's be clear, God is always on Israel's side. But what's your viewpoint on when they were taken into captivity on at least three occasions? Would you call that on Israel's side? This is just an innocent question. Um, well, thank you for that question, because it's it's a hugely interesting one, and yeah. I appreciate the sincerity of how that question is being uh, asked uh, a, a question, and and actually, it's good to ask, uh, you know, to address yeah, these questions challenge ourselves, because yeah. there are those who are not as sincere uh, that will sometimes ask a question. Well, is Israel's, you know, is God on Israel's side? Mm. Um, how sometimes they will coin the phrase, "How can God be on Israel's side if yeah. they have a particular biased view?" Uh, so we're just going to address this and. And of course, we understand in the, uh, throughout Israel's uh, history and throughout the Bible, uh, we can see that there were um, a number of occasions uh, where you know uh, Israel suffered as a consequence of not um, uh, following God's commands, mm -hmm. and and then we see this pattern, and I'd call it a pattern of them returning to God and that relationship being reinstated. Mm. But I would just say we have to be very careful because the Bible says uh, that God has not forsaken mm -hmm. Israel and he, is, uh, he has made an eternal covenant and will never break that covenant yeah. and has not broken that covenant. Mm. And if you think about the parable of the prodigal son, for example, parable that Jesus told, just using this as illustration, uh, where the father, uh, where you know the son takes the inheritance and mm. spends it, and then and then returns. Where did the father go? Yeah, the father stayed, and was sad at the prodigal son's departure, but then was there to welcome the son back. And and it to me, how I see it, is that God remains yeah and actually we can think about it's not just about israel but about all of our lives in the fact is like is god on my side is he on your side mm. well god remains and it was abraham lincoln who during the civil war um was asked whether or not god was on his side and he said sir my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side. Yeah. For God is always right. Yeah. And so I think to address this question, rather than our focus be, well, is God on Israel's side? The focus should be, our greatest concern is, is Israel on God's side? Yeah. And there are scriptures, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 27 to 31, says, And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left in few number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. That is like that. Our concern is not whether God is on our side, but are we? Yeah. on God's side when you are in distress and all these things come, come upon you in the latter days when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice and it says in verse 31 for the Lord your God is a merciful God yeah. he will not forsake you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them today I can guarantee that there are people throughout the nation of Israel who are calling upon the God of their forefathers, yeah. the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God is merciful. Yeah. God is gracious. And actually, um, we see this throughout Scripture, uh, reaffirming that turn to God because 
He hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah, yeah. He has stayed put. Yeah. He has kept his promise. Like that father in the prodigal son, he has stayed put and he is there. Isaiah 41 verses 8 to 10. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner, saying to you, you are my servant. I've chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Um, and looking into things yet to happen in the um, Gog Magog War, as, in Ezekiel 39, it says that God will undertake on Israel's behalf. Yep. It says that I will set my glory among the nations. This is verse 21 of Ezekiel 39. All the nations shall see my judgment which I have executed and my hand which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hands of their, hands of their enemies and they all fell by the sword. According to their own cleanness and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel and I will be jealous for my holy name. And they have borne their shame and all their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me when they dwelt safely in their own land and no one made them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also, but also brought them back to their land Mm -hmm. and left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them any more. For I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. Yeah, amen. And I'll just point out that people might misinterpret that a little bit because it says hiding his face from them. Well, you know, if someone is saying, well, then that God wasn't with them on that moment. Actually, I think that's looking more in terms of salvation. It's looking in terms of more Messiah, that sort of thing, which we can talk about sort of in another aspect. but. I was thinking exactly the same as you with the father-son relationship, not necessarily about the prodigal Mm. son, but because we hadn't discussed this before we filmed, you you sort of mentioned, oh, let's read this comment and talk about it. So I had thoughts of my own. And it was the same thing, the father-son scenario. Actually, when you discipline your son, you haven't turned against your son when you're disciplining. You still love your son. You still are for your son. In fact, you're actually disciplining them for their good, for their benefit. Mm. And it's not because you're not disciplining them because you've you know turned your back on them or you've um you know been disobedient is because they've been disobedient or they've you know that sort of thing so that was the sort of thought i was having so i'm glad you used the prodigal son example um but i just want to raise uh romans 11 because this is one of the great ones which dispels replacement theology in so many ways and i'll just quote it i'll read it for you it says i say then god has not rejected his people has he far from it For I too am an Israelite, this is uh, the Apostle Paul speaking, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And then this bit here. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? Quote, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, since otherwise grace is no longer grace. And so I just want to point out that obviously this is, you know, Paul is saying Elijah pleaded with God to go against Israel, and God said no. And he. He said, no, there's still a remnant. They're still my mm. people. They're still following me. Mm. And 
this goes back to the grace thing. You were just saying that mm. in the scripture there. Merciful God. Grace, merciful God, yeah. grace. And this is the thing, like people, especially people who are into replacement theology, they say God is finished with Israel. That was then when they had to do sacrifice mm. and that was works. Now we live under grace. We do live under grace. Thankfully, we live under grace. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord, right? But Israel is also under grace now. And mm. they may not know this yet, you know, um, but they are under grace. And it is through grace, because of the forefathers, because of the promise God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, mm. that he will reveal himself to them, that mm. he will protect them and keep them safe. And uh, I, I, have you got any other scriptures? Well, only, only just a, a scripture earlier on regarding the Gog Magog war in Ezekiel 38, verse 18. Um, God is merciful and um, to his people. And it says, and it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, okay, the land of Israel, mm -hmm. says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. Mm. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. So is God going to be on Israel's side? Yep. You bet. Yep. Like, he's not just going to be on their side. He is going to show an outpouring of wrath upon the enemies yeah. of Israel. It will be not just the father welcoming back a son. Mm. It will be the father taking up, taking up the arms. Yeah, exactly. Spiritually speaking. Yeah. And so, what we do just to answer, just to address, sorry, the I hope it's helped. Um, go towards answering it uh, is when we are asked the question is Israel sorry is God on Israel's side just to think is Israel on God's side yeah now if you have any doubt whether Israel is on God's side okay the least that you can do is pray that Israel will look to the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob yeah. and especially at this time when the enemies of Israel are ganging up against it, yep. uh, we know that there are many, many people, many Jewish people who are calling upon God to deliver Israel at this time. And do you know what? God will hear that prayer yep. because he is faithful. That's why I believe we can have full assurance that Israel will come through this. Yeah, exactly. And will be victorious. Yep. And yeah, and I think as well, the other thing is we as Christians can be assured of our salvation because of the promises God made to yeah. Israel, which are still relevant today. Yes. Because if God can break his promise with Israel, he can break his yes. promise with us. But he hasn't broken his promise with either. Yeah. And he never will. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And on that note, yep. it is time to say goodbye. But please, before you log off, please do like and share and comment on this podcast. Uh, subscribe if you're not already subscribed and to support Kufi further um, to make a donation towards our work then please visit www.cufi.org.uk forward slash donate and please join us next time when we have a, a special podcast remembering October the 7th uh, we invite you to join us for that and until next time may the Lord bless you and keep you and let us continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem bye bye <laughs>